I mean, that's an interesting question and a good one. Because in the book, I mean, when you're looking at a, a corporation, which is essentially a monumental titanic business enterprise, and I did, you know, give some attention to that, but I was focusing on a moral arc to the story. And so, you know, when I divided the parts up from its rise to its zenith to its its fall, I mean, I was tracing the moral arc. And oddly enough, I think the the, the moral low point of the company, its fall, correlated to its highest period of profits. And that was in the mid 19th century when it was, you know, quite a nasty, it had transformed itself from being a mostly benevolent or disinterested or, you know, culturally integrated entity for 150 years. The whole corporate culture of the thing changed. Um, and it was the acts of one individual that ended up doing this, George Simpson fellow, um, who was a very, very nasty fellow on a whole bunch of different levels. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this event in the American Inspiration Author Series presented by American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society with the GBH Forum Network. I'm Margaret Talkett, the producer of literary programs. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of history, looking particularly at Canada and the frontier lands of North America just days before Canada Day. Our featured author, Canadian Stephen Bound, has written 10 books on the history of exploration, science, and ideas, including The Medical Mystery of Scurvy and the Lives of Captain George Vancouver and Roald Amundsen. His works have been translated into nine languages and won many awards, including the BC Book Prize, the Alberta Book Award, and the William Mills Prize for Polar Books. His previous work, The Island of Blue Foxes, about Bering's voyage to Alaska, was shortlisted for the RBC Taylor Prize. Stephen has also informed us just tonight that the company has won the 2020 J.W. Defoe Award for the best book on Canada in the world. Jeff Breithaupt, tonight's moderator, is a writer, songwriter, podcaster, and vice president at Manhattan School of Music in New York. He co-authored two books about pop music in the 1970s for St. Martin's Press. Jeff is also well known as the lyricist half of the Breithaupt Brothers, an award-winning songwriting team whose work has been interpreted by such Broadway and jazz stars as Kelly O'Hara, Catherine Russell, and Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Jeff is an expert advocate for Canada's arts and cultural scene and has promoted Canadian talent on the New York and international stage. Jeff is joining us tonight from the Mystic Seaport Museum. We're very grateful to them for giving him a Wi-Fi home. Um, he is typically at New York in New York City, where he is at work launching the podcast Cansplaining with Jeff Breithaupt. So he'll be on in a moment, but for now, to start us off, welcome Stephen. Um, you have lived, you know, all over Canada. You were born in Ottawa, and and, um, and you lived in British Columbia, and now you're living in Alberta. Um, is that you're in the Rocky Mountains? Is that correct? I am right in the Rockies. Now I have the whole country covered. Yeah, I've lived on the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific. I've actually traveled and driven all over the U.S. too, so I I get a pretty good uh, it's good good sense of the geography of this continent. Well, your work really covers all of Canada as well. And I learned so much from it. I really enjoyed reading it. I got educated about Master and so many other folks who um, have impacted US history as well. So to my mind, your book is really borderless. Uh, and it's really also like our celebration of Canada Day today. Um, we are feeling borderless and we wanna join you in raising a glass to Canada Day. Um, before we start though, and Jeff hop on, just, just lay some groundwork. Tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us um, what was the company and you know, welcome, tell us what you want. Sure, I mean, as an author, I, I have a, you know, a great interest in history that goes back all the way to the unfashionable age of 18. Um, no one was interested in history when I was that young, ex except for me. But my interest has always been biographical and narrative rather than academic. Um, it's the stories of people's lives lived within the context of their times. It's always fascinated me. The decisions they made, the, the choices they made for their, for their life, their understanding of the world. Um, 
you know, because, uh, you know, these people are genetically exactly the same as us, our, all of our ancestors, but, but uh, they had, they lived their lives within a different intellectual and cultural context. They had no maps. They had no phones or cell phones. They didn't even have roads half the time, they, you know, by sailing, by sailing ship into unknown, uh, unknown worlds. So, of course, this affects the decisions that they made and their understanding of the world. Um, you know, so that's, that's always been my prime, prime main interest, even when writing books. And, uh, you know, I come by that, that interest, honestly. My mother's, a, you know, a devoted genealogist. I often joke with her that, you know, we both have an interest in people with two sets of dates after their name. And um, her main objective has always been to find, you know, some story to pin on to this name so that it's not just a, a statistic. Um, can be anything, whether they fell off the harbor, fell into the harbor when they were getting off a boat or whether they were scandalously married twice at some time. I mean, these are the kind of things she's interested in. Just something that you know, because think of our ancestors, we have two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 120, you go back a couple hundred years and you have so many of these people, they're, they're not, they're just statistics unless we find some way to humanize them. And so I always want to try and humanize history so that people can relate to it in a sense, rather than just a bunch of uh, dates that need to be memorized. Um, you know, my own ancestors came to uh, North America in the late 19th century. Some went to Nova Scotia, some went to Montreal, some went to the Boston area, and they moved back and forth. There was Quigleys and Peterkins and Buchholzes. Um, I even had an ancestor who came from Montreal and then left and moved out to Portland, Oregon. And as soon as he got there, he was murdered by an Italian, <laughs> an Italian guy. And I can honestly say um, there used to be a lot of racist hatred toward Italians back then when you read the newspaper accounts of it. So, you know, the world is a fascinating, interesting place and has remained so much. My interest in the Hudson's Bay Company it comes from traveling around and visiting and seeing the sites where there, you know, historical markers or plaques or forts or anything that's left around. There's, there's some tangible reminder that something happened in this place. And when you're dealing with the fur trade that went on for so many hundreds of years in our part of the world, um, these, these little windows into what happened are, you know, just a, fa a fascinating and important way to learn what happened. What are the ghosts that inhabit this area that we're visiting through right now? Because there's more layers to social interaction than what's currently going on right now. And we're all affected by the decisions that happened in the past. And we're affected by the people who, who made those decisions too. Um, you know, there's so many... There's stories of adventures and hardship and danger and, and all the lives that were lived within that economic and social context. And it's just fascinating to know on the banks of the river at this place, below this mountain or at this little fort, all of these adventures happened. People lived their whole lives there, raised their children, moved on to other things. They died. They were buried in the cemetery. Um, it's, just, uh, it's, just, it's just fascinating to me, that these windows into the past from that way. And... Well, Stephen, I have to say that I think you have um, effectively with this book communicated that enthusiasm you had as a young young guy before everyone else had caught up with you and gotten interested in this and, and really created um, a most readable history book. And um, I think Margaret touched on it being an adventure story. It really is an adventure story. And, and if you don't mind, I'm going to take you right back to the origin um, of the Hudson's Bay Company, because I think it's fascinating. And as a Canadian studying the fur trade and the Cour d'Ivoire and all the stuff that we studied, I, I certainly had never heard of two French brothers-in-law who effectively betrayed their country and went to England to pitch the King of England on an idea for setting up fur trading in Hudson's Bay. Would you, would you just give a little bit of the background of those two characters? Because I found that incredibly fascinating. Yeah, I mean, those, those guys are quite a, quite the little duo of, of roguery. They, yeah. you know, they were from, uh, they were from France and they sailed over to the, to the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway back, back in the 17th century, mid 17th century. Um, you know, of course, that pre predates the existence of Canada or the United States by 150 years almost, but the, when they were arriving, and there was not a lot of European settlement there at all. So they had to integrate themselves within indigenous societies, specifically the, the Iroquois one, and they were involved in the fur trade. And of course, um, 
the governors of, of New France didn't want people leaving off to go to the fur trade because they wanted to try and keep them there and maintain their, you know, their small little settlements that they were developing. But these guys wanted nothing to do with that. They wanted to head off on some adventures and they set off and they were trading furs and they explored all the way west to the west of Lake Superior. And they, they realized when they were out there that, um, that there was well-developed continental trade networks that were converging on these areas near the headwaters of the Mississippi River, the Mandan settlements. And people from all over the place were bringing their, their valuable furs and their, and their food items and their carved leather and their seashells. Everything was converging on this one area. And on the way they back, they went on a, a detour trip and it, it, some people led them up to the southern shore of James Bay in present day Ontario. And there they encountered uh, ruins of what they assumed was the wreck of uh, Henry Hudson's sh uh, ship from 1610. Not a ship, a, a little fort that Hudson made there when he was there. And, the, and then they started to realize, wow, if British mariners had come this far into the continent, you know, decades before we even got here, they could do it again. And if anyone could actually get into the heart of a continent, tie into those pre-existing trade networks, they could make a fortune to sell, you know, trading all the furs. And when they even let me interrupt you just for clarification. I just want to get the names of the two um, Tour de Bois out there. It was Radisson. And will you pronounce the second? Well, I would pronounce it Grasselier. However, a French person, French speaker might have a little different inflection on that. But yeah. The, I, I'm sure our audience was curious. Yeah, Radisson. I think in little children's books from... 50 years ago, they used to call them radishes and gooseberries, <laughs> which I don't know. No one does that anymore. But but yeah, they, they basically started the trade because they, they had this whole idea that, wow, if the British could get, well, if anyone could get in there. And they tried to peddle their idea to the governors in New France. But the, the French had a very, the French had a very, at that time, uh, desire to control commerce and control trade. And these guys were rogues and they had violated, they had no permit. So they were actually had a bunch of the, all of their money and their furs were confiscated except for a small amount. And they were blacklisted and told they weren't allowed to do it again. And they were like, what the heck? I mean, this is insane. So they tried to go down, they left and went down to New York state, went down the, uh, you know, the Hudson river when they were in Albany and they were trying to sell this to various Dutch traders and English traders who were there. Uh, no one was interested. So eventually they did sail over to England. They interested the English king who immediately grasped the geopolitical ramifications of what they could do, you know, make a pile of money and sort of get back at the French at the same, same time. You know, the English and French are always fighting in those there. And that was the genesis for the whole idea that English ships could sail, you know, the northern route, go into the, through Hudson Strait and down through the ice choked Hudson's Bay across to the western shore where they would set up some little primitive rudimentary trading outputs and uh, start you know, engaging in, in a new form of commerce. And and the new form of commerce was built around the trade of these beaver pelts. And, you know, I before I started your book, I thought I understood why the beaver pelts were valuable in Europe. I thought it was for coats and for things, to, you know, to wear that um, would keep people warm. Sort of that was my sort of primitive idea of why people wanted fur. But your book makes it very clear that the value of the beaver felt, uh pelts had to do with the fact that they were used to make felt for hats, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that is the most fascinating thing. I mean, felt, yeah, of course, made with mercury fumes. So that's where the term mad as a hatter comes from, too, because all these people who were transferring the, you know, the, the fur into felt by mag and all together breathed the mercury fumes all day long, and they went insane from it. So anyway, that's where mad as a hatter comes from. That's amazing. The, um, that the hats, because felt can be manipulated and molded, you could get different shapes out of it. So it was really useful for fashion, but it was also somewhat warm and waterproof. So it was a very, very useful substance. Um, and of course, they some of these things were enormously expensive, almost like family heirlooms. You would pass them down to the next generation if you died. Like they were, uh, um, yeah, they're just extremely valuable. So the great irony though, is that the most valuable fur was the fur that had been worn by people for a year. So, you know, if someone had actually wore a whole set of fur, say throughout the winter, um, and all the outer guard hairs wore off as the people used it, and they were about, you know, the summer is coming, they're getting, they want to carry this big heavy fur around with them forever. So they were about to get rid of it. And someone shows up and says, no, 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 don't throw away your old used clothing. I'll pay you a whole pile of money. Here's the axes and hatchets and a bunch of tobacco or any other thing they could think of. 
you know, pots, pans, metal implements. That was the one item that was missing in, in all the trade networks around here was manufactured metal implements. And so these people immediately were like, wow, this is pretty good. Someone's giving me a bunch of useful things and all I have to do is give them my used clothing. So I jokingly call it the used clothing uh, trade. That's essentially what it was because they, the furs were, were more valuable to them if they'd been worn, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, the slow establishment, once this took hold as an idea, the slow establishment of trading um, uh, forts in Hudson Bay, obviously they were, they were situated at the um, sort of where the rivers opened up out of Hudson's Bay or rather dumped into Hudson's Bay. And what were the advantages of setting up there? Well, way back then, I mean, they had no, of course, there were no maps. I mean, we operate in a very different intellectual world back then. You know, for those people to sail, it would take them, you know, six weeks to cross the ocean. It was extremely dangerous. Um, each direction it was, and the scurvy was always on the ships and diseases and the sailors were dying. And there was always a possibility of shipwreck or, or frostbite or, or uh, any other kind of disaster you could imagine. So they didn't want to go very far. They got to the shore of this very hostile land and they... Um, had no way to communicate with home. They had no way, they had to be very self-sufficient. A supply ship could come once a year. So they ended up building forts right by these rivers um, that could be serviced by their bigger ships coming from overseas. And the, the interesting thing is that the, the whole retail part of the trade, which is the sense of um, the furs were brought to the fort by people. Um, the company itself didn't actually venture inland for probably uh, half half a century they just sat there or even more than half a century probably 80 years they just sat there on the fort and the whole retail aspect of the trade was done by mostly Cree middlemen who had these big networks extending all the way to the Rocky Mountains and down into the Ohio Valley and everything where they were transferring all the furs and bringing them themselves you know up to 80 canoe loads worth worth of furs and they would negotiate and do all the trade themselves buy up a vast quantity of goods and spread it out throughout the entire western and northern part of the continent and conduct all the trade themselves so it's, people often think the companies must have been there doing all this uh commerce and business and was a huge monopoly controlling everything and it was that in the mid 19th century but when it began it was nothing it was just the indigenous people were using the company almost as a wholesale distributor while managing the retail aspect of the trade independently and that and went you, on for ages yeah and you indicate that for quite some time from sort of the mid to late 1600s through the, the 18th century, the balance of power between the company and their indigenous, in effect, partners at the time um, was really a, a balance. Um, and, I, and I thought it was fascinating that you, your descriptions of how the company worked with the indigenous uh, suppliers of, of the, the pelts that they, that thanks to those French rogues who had a real understanding of the, the indigenous culture, they were, they were sort of, um, uh, the practice was that they would um, work with the indigenous cultures and respect um, the traditions uh, of their partners in effect. And, um, and it really was sort of a balance of power that in the end tilted towards the, the company and we'll get to that. But there was a sort of after some conflict with the French over over the the monopoly in Hudson's Bay. There was a, a relative sort of the 18th century was a relative period of calm for this yeah. endeavor. Yeah, basically that is true, and I think a lot of people miss that nuance to the history of it. I mean, um, when you think of it, you know, all these Europeans were coming over at one time. For most of the 18th century, there was probably only 500 Europeans there. But this big entity was transporting a lot of furs back and forth, conducting a lot of business. Well, that wasn't all just done by that small handful of people. Um, a lot of those people, because they had to sign indentured uh, servitude contracts for sometimes up to seven years periods, and it was nearly impossible to return home. You'd be there for seven years. I mean, a lot of them stayed on more and more. They, they had indigenous wives and then families that were there. And so they were intimately connected. They were tied in to those societies. Um, in the sense that the fur trade could almost be looked at as a form of uh, cultural diplomacy as being like the primary skill to success in that industry. They all had to learn those languages and those customs. And they had, you know, of course, their in-laws were further inland. And, and uh, so, you know, the company was, it was intimately linked to those societies and, and definitely 
there was not a lot, they, they weren't in conflict with each other at all. It was a mutually beneficial thing, as all trade is really. Um, when there's a, you know, when both sides are having something that they want from it and are able to sort of pursue their interests and settle on the price and the price itself kind of is not dictated by one party. It's sort of uh, what can be reasonably accommodated within the, you know, it's a lot of work to collect up beaver pelts. You can't just, you know, demand it for nothing. But on the other hand, it's a lot of work. You think, I would always imagine like, think of a tiny needle, a sewing needle. And we think, well, whatever, sewing needle, we throw that away now. That's almost worth nothing. But back then, imagine it has to be mined from some mine in England, shipped out to a smelter near London or something, melted down, turned into a little uh, cast of iron, loaded onto a creaky old rotting sailing ship with a bunch of scurvy ridden sailors, driven all the way across the ocean for months at a time. Maybe the ship sinks every now and then. Then it has to be unloaded into that palisade fort on the shore of a frozen northern Bay. Um, some people trade for it. It has to be loaded into a, a canoe or a series of canoes and spend the next several months paddling and paddling thousands of <laughs> miles across the continent. And then someone brings it up when they get there and says, uh, here's a needle. I want a whole beaver pelt for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Well, actually, it's interesting because, you know, despite this relative period of calm, once the company was set up and some of the conflict with the French over the territory was dealt with, in the early days, obviously, the indigenous population that they were dealing with was decimated by disease. And I don't want to gloss over that. Um, how did that affect the establishment of this trading relationship? Yeah, that, I mean, the disease was a horrible and ever-present aspect of all historical relations between indigenous people and the Europeans ever since they first able to come across the Atlantic on ships and in the in the context of the the fur trade um, you know well, we famously know about the diseases that ravaged Mexico City and, and, and destroyed basically the Aztec civilization that was there I mean there were diseases specifically there was one uh, a disease wave of smallpox that came up from Mexico City in around 1780 and it came up the eastern part of the continent along the ridge of the you know up by through um, Idaho and Montana and Alberta on that eastern part of the plains and then crossed over the Hudson's Bay. I mean, that actually, actually killed 80% of the population in certain areas. Now, you know, just because of the, you know, the, the coronavirus pandemic, people have a little bit more of a sense of the fear and social disruption that can that can come about by a disease, uh, you know, and the, the terror that can go into it before realize, before people can accommodate that into the thing. But uh, the death rate of coronavirus is almost negligible. Like seriously, in a historical context, actually try and imagine 80% or even 50% of the people at, like dying horribly. And how can a culture accommodate that and still go on. And the Hudson's Bay Company was, of course, go out of its way to try and protect those people as much as they could. But there's no vaccines. There's not even any medical knowledge. Medical knowledge at that time was like bloodletting and how to balance the four bodily humors. You know, it's it, stuff that makes no sense right now and could have been harmful or better off doing almost nothing. Um, yeah, so disease cannot be dis dismissed. It destroyed populations. And that, ironically, is what brought the the Hudson's Bay Company further into the continent, which set the next stage of its development is because there was such a population decline that there was a drop in business and there was not as many people around anymore. And the, and the, the company said, well, we, we can't even be here now. We have to go inland to the people because they're having a hard time coming to us. And so they started to go in along those river systems and uh, establish more forts. And uh, eventually over time, their trading system on all these rivers over several generations worked its way all the way to the Pacific Ocean, following down the Columbia River right through like Washington State and Oregon and all the, all those areas, as well as what's now British Columbia. And so that's when the company, that was more like in the early 19th century, in the beginning of the late 18th century, the company just expanded rapidly with hundreds of little tiny forts sprinkled everywhere. Even I think our audience today is quite interested in and some very specifically based on some of the questions we've received um, about their ancestry. And I, I wanted, to, that leads into a question about who was it that was doing the labor on the company side? I, I believe you mentioned Scottish lowlands and Orkney Islands. And, and was there a real predominance of folks from that part of the world that were coming over? And if so, why? Uh, absolutely there was. There there were, actually there was three there was three main components to the to the labor force the overseas labor force because of course there was an indigenous labor force that's one of the components and there were a lot of iroquois 
involved. Like we think of voyageurs as being like the, oh, the, you know, the jolly Frenchmen paddling their canoes. A lot of those voyageurs were actually Iroquois or blends French, mixed heritage, Iroquois, French. So that's almost, you know, two of the three is that there was French in Iroquois coming from the Montreal, the St. Lawrence area or upper Hudson River zone. And then there was a lot of people coming from the more northern area who exactly Orkney Islands and lowland Scots. All, all, for many, many years, it was almost exclusively, almost exclusively people from that area of the world manning all the Hudson's Bay Company forts. And the, particularly the Scottish, um, the Scottish ended up being almost synonymous with the Hudson's Bay Company. And then later the Northwest Company too. Yeah. They were all the upper management was was Scottish. Even when the voyageurs were doing a lot of the labor, the management and the field partners were also Scottish. So the, you know, people talk about Métis and they think the Métis is the French and indigenous sort of blended culturally together. But a lot of the Métis were actually um, had Scottish ancestry as well. Huge numbers of them, in fact. And why did that happen? I don't want to spend too much time on this, but why did that happen? What was it about the Scottish? You know, how how did that predominance of Scottish uh, workers happen? Well, the, you mean there is a lot of like poor economy, especially in the Orkney Isles and certain areas in Scotland. There was mm -hmm. not a lot of economic opportunity at that time, so people were desperate in one sense, uh, perhaps adventurous spirit because look what you had to do i think i already touched on it earlier how hard it was to get over to sea i mean it takes a certain kind of person to say yeah oh, what the heck yes yeah, you're all signed onto the ship could be 50 50 chance of death or whatever in the next while seven years okay you know buy friends and family maybe i'll see you after seven years and just disappear into some rugged extremely harsh life in an unknown land where no one has any idea where it is um mm -hmm. that takes a certain kind of person i think a lot of those uh, scottish ancestors a lot of scottish people had kind of a very uh, toughened view of the world and were willing to set aside personal comfort in order to either survive or pursue adventure or whatever so amazing and it, you know we're talking about the balance of power and the relative calm of the trading relationship between the indigenous uh people especially the cree um who were working with um the hudson's bay company counterparts through the 18th century, but then the balance of power started to shift towards the company, didn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, especially with the, as we were mentioning, the population declines from disease. And then once the company had infiltrated its forts throughout the, throughout the content, continent, um, people became, indigenous people became, you know, dependent on those goods. So those were no longer things that they could, that they wanted to have, but they could mostly do without. They weren't just things that made their life easier. They, they were things that were indispensable to their very survival. Um, and then of course, as beaver populations declined in certain mm -hmm. areas um, and the people still need those items in order to survive, then you have a company which ha has a disproportionate power over those people because they need the blankets, they need the frying pans, the pots. Most importantly, they need ammunition for the guns. And in some cases, um, there were people who were very unscrupulous and they would, they could even cause periods of localized starvation by refusing to hand out ammunition to people so they could hunt throughout the winter season. That wasn't common because of course the company is a business and its employees, as I was mentioning, were married into those societies and their own children were mixed heritage. So they weren't, they weren't in a sense trying to dis destroy one half of themselves. And over, over time, almost the, all these Scottish people who originally came over, it was their children, their mixed heritage children who were the company and mm -hmm. who pushed their enterprise further west. And so mm -hmm. that's why you have, you know, all the Scottish culture bagpipes being played on the uh, Columbia River in Fort Vancouver. And one of the predominant languages being spoken is Cree and, ga and gaelic -y type of thing. I mean, wow, how did that get on the Pacific yeah. Ocean? Those cultures spread all the way out there, the mixed heritage, and they were blended together. Yeah, that. What, before we get to some of the questions that have been sent in from um, our audience this evening, um, what would you define as sort of the peak era of success for the company, the zenith, as you called it in, in your book? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question and a good one, because in the book, I mean, when you're looking at a, a corporation, which is essentially a monumental titanic business enterprise, and I do, mm. 
you know, give some attention to that. But I was focusing on a moral arc to the story. And so, you know, when I divided the parts up from its rise to its zenith to its its fall, I mean, I was tracing the moral arc. And oddly enough, I think the 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 moral low point of the company, its fall, correlated to its highest period of profits. And that was in the mid 19th century when it was you know, quite a nasty, it had transformed itself from being a mostly benevolent or disinterested or you know, culturally integrated entity for 150 years. The whole corporate culture of the thing changed. Um, and it was the acts of one individual that ended up doing this, George Simpson fellow, um, who was very, very nasty fellow on a whole bunch of different levels. But he single-handedly, because he was there for over 30 years, shifted the corporate culture and turned it into a nasty, controlling, domineering, monopolistic, exploitative entity. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that's, that's how it shifts. And that's how a thing which existed for so long in, people, in people's minds has such negative connotations for certain aspects of history, certain, as- certain time period of history. And they, they both coexist. So the... Mm-hmm. Um, I actually, it's a nice segue. You talked about the, the decline in the beaver population and that affected the company throughout its history, um, even early on. Um, one of the questions we had uh, come in through the chat was about that specifically. Please address the company's practices regarding the diminishing beaver population. How did the, country, how did the company actually um, deal with that when it became a threat to their business? Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, also I mean, from the point of view, ecological, ecologically speaking, was there a concern that they were really just going to drive these animals into extinction? Yeah, I mean, that, that was a pretty, it, that could easily happen because especially in around, I think it was around 1820, I think it was someone from the New England area invented a thing which is still around with us now called the leg hold trap. And previously that did not used to exist. But when that came in, that made hunting beavers a lot easier. So Mm -hmm. the company had existed for almost 150 years by that point, but the leg hold trap meant that all of a sudden you could have rapidly increasing beaver harvests. Um, And of course people had to buy the traps. So the company was actually selling the traps and then getting extra beaver harvests. And of course that extra pressure on the beaver populations started to mean that areas were declining in in the beavers and the company, you know, under George Simpson was very callous in the way that it managed. They managed the beaver population to suit their own specific um, needs on the, on the market, which was always set in London. And they almost began this thinking of the indigenous people uh, in, in a sense, almost like the beavers. They need to be managed and controlled like the beavers. And they would just, like George Simpson would just, in the 1830s or 40s, would just more or less close down, a, close down the fort in an area that had been there for 80 years servicing the people's commercial needs. Just set, shut it down. Ah, oh, the beavers are not enough of them in that area. We want to move the fort and the beaver population will recover. But of course, there's people living there. I mean, how do they, how do they respond to that? The entire you would just shut down the whole economy in a region. So in a sense, you could just say, oh, yes, that's very ecologically sensitive of him. Isn't that nice? The beavers are going to rebound. But he almost effectively destroyed the lives of hundreds of people in each little region that he was doing that for. So yes, they did manage the beaver population. And no, they didn't do it in a very humane way, mm-hmm. mostly by the 19, mid-19th century. Um, you, I think you talk about the fall of the company you know, you refer to it as the fall in your in your final the final part of your book. Do you see the fall as having been sort of precipitated by the end of the monopoly that the company enjoyed, or do you see it at what? How would you uh, explain the fall? Because they still exist, and we want to get to the sort of the future of the company, in, yeah, perhaps yeah. in name only. But yeah, well. For sure, it is in, in name only as a fur trading entity. I mean, it, it lost its monopoly in 1870, but it had mostly been working towards losing that monopoly for 10 years prior to that. They just couldn't agree on it because, it, you know, even back then, the idea of having, you know, a shareholder driven capitalist corporation that's the actual only form of government in a region, this doesn't, uh, uh, well, you know, it's, it, that's not a, we, you can't, they have no authority to govern people's lives, to pass laws. And, and especially, 
it became a very complicated situation because with the declining population of indigenous societies and the increasing role of the company in every aspect of people's lives, hmm. in what, what moral authority did they have to order people around and control them and to impose laws on people? I mean, um, it was obviously very, uh, it was an uneasy point of view. And I, there was a fellow named Dr. John McLaughlin, who was a Montreal, he was born of a Montreal uh, physician and he sort of did medical training. Anyway, he left and went out to the Columbia River and managed the company's Columbia district, as they called it, for, you know, decades. And he was there. He was essentially the only authority in that region. Over time, he became so powerful and Fort Vancouver was so well, well managed. I mean, it was well managed. He did a good job that he was uh, he was like a little mini dictator or a potentate, a lord, lord from his feudal castle controlling the entire region of, mm -hmm. you know, Oregon and Washington's power range. But even he recognized that like when a bunch of American settlers started coming out along the Oregon Trail in the 18, late 1830s after the economic crash of 1837, um, you know, thousands of people every year were, sh were showing up and he was like, wow, I'm not equipped to deal with this. Head down the Willamette Valley to the south and go settle there. But he, you know, he was giving them credit at the company store, even though he was told not to, because he said, I'm not going to let those people starve. Mm -hmm. And what, how can I be the government anyway? And so he kept writing back to, to Britain saying, what the heck am I supposed to do? Technically, I'm, I'm part of the British thing, but I don't have any political authority over any of these people. Um, so he recognized that he knew that. And the people who were coming said, well, you don't have any authority over us. You know, screw you. And eventually, you know, a person died and they had a cattle herd and they didn't have a will. And the people got together and said, well, we need to create some kind of set of laws for ourselves. And it's not going to be that idiotic British company that's up there, even though they gave us all the credit at the store. Um, so they, they set up their own form of provisional government. And eventually they voted themselves to join in the United States. You know, but the, by then, the whole idea of a monopoly corporation being a whole being the seat of government was an anachronism and no one wanted to accept it. And the people inv involved in running it didn't even want to either. Mm -hmm. Like McLaughlin himself, said, I'm not going to do that. That's not my job. I'm. You know, so the whole thing just kind of collapsed at that point. Um, Stephen, a couple of questions uh, from the chat um, from our audience tonight, um, and and many of them have to do with the ancestry. I think that people are interested in um, perhaps ancestors specifically uh, from their own families who worked with the Hudson's Bay Company, and they're they're eager to sort of trace some of that history. And one of the questions, which I think summarizes a lot of that for people are, are there employee records that exist for genealogical research? And, and you know, if there are, did you tap them? And also, are they widely available? Yeah, I mean, that is a, a complicated question to answer. Um, mm -hmm. I'd be, if someone sent me an email after, or it'll denote, I, I would share with them some of the more specific details. But I mean, yes, detailed records exist. Some of the more interesting ones that have, you know, historical significance, a lot of it has been digitized and published and you can easily, actually, I don't know if it's easily, some of it is easily obtainable because it's been digitized. Some of it is published and an academic library will have books on it like translations of journals or, or collections of records or whatever. Some of it exists in the archives in Winnipeg. The Hudson's Bay Company archives were there. Um, and some of it has no records. Of course, a lot of the material having to deal with indigenous peoples has no records because those people kept no written records of their lives. And of course, the women are mostly written out of the story. So they always they ha always have these uh, story about all these, uh, the fur traders. And of course, they're all male. Um, Okay, they all had wives and they all had children, but there's very little record of that, except for in their personal records, they might mention that they had a wife or a child or it comes up somewhere. But so, yeah, prob if you count women as people, which we all do now these days, but of course, back then, that was not necessarily the case at all. Um, half of the people who worked for the company were indigenous and they were women. So, but there's not going to, you're not going to find a lot of record on, on that in a written sense. Right. Um one person wrote in and said, and I quote, I think Mr. Bone's approach is just what a genealogical or a genealogist ought to strive for when it comes to painting a picture about the many folks we discover, but who are so often just numbers in our rich past. What has he learned 
about trying to put those pictures on the oral histories of the First Nation participants in the Hudson's Bay Company. And then secondly, how can I learn more about my female Cree ancestors who married the Orkney men? I think that's an Im incredibly interesting part of the story. Yeah, and one that's not very well told in a lot of uh, previous histories on this. And uh, you know, the, the unfortunate thing is that, like I had mentioned, there's not a lot of detailed records. So unless you can find someone that wrote something, and some of the Orkney men who came up were also illiterate too. Um, it's just there were not a lot of people who were writing things down and keeping track of it. And the company archives may have something, like it may mention, oh, so-and-so was here. And they went to this, it'll mention which, which forts they were posted to. But it won't necessarily tell you that they had six children and their and their first wife died in this year and then they they had a new wife and then you know they eventually died or they went back to the orkneys or whatever they ended up doing some of that information just peters out and i you're not able to obtain so it's when you're looking for a specific person it's a bit of luck is going to be involved and and trying to have a story associated with them that's even more luck but they're you know, if you're only if you're wanting to find stories that could apply generally to people such as your ancestors, then of course you will find something. If you're looking for a story that's specifically related to one specific person, that could be more of a challenge. Um, are you aware? Of, one of the things, um, one of the questions we had is how did the Northwest Company, New England, English, Dutch, and Swedish fur trading companies impact the Hudson's Bay Company? I mean, that's a huge question. But can you touch on how they dealt with that competition? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, all these people wanted furs. And here's the, the thing. We were talking about beaver populations. You know, they called it being beavered out. Um, the Hudson River system used to be very rich in beavers, but it was beavered out very early in the, you know, before the 18th century. There was no longer a lot of good quality beavers coming from there. And then it turned out that the, that's why the company kept pushing further west is because they wanted to get into new territories where the, you know, the profit margin was greater because there was a lot of untapped beaver. People could easily bring in 10 beavers and say, oh, look, here's my 10 beaver. Instead of like working really hard to kill and, and skin and, and bring in like six or something, right? So, right. I mean, that's why they kept moving. And so that by the company, by virtue of being so far north and having this access through large ships right into the Western coast of Hudson's Bay with river systems that plunged all the way down you know, you could get to the Pacific Ocean all the way by paddling your canoe with one 50 kilometer portage in the Rocky Mountains called Athabasca Pass, which, you know, I've hiked over it and it's quite interesting, but it connects you from the Athabasca system to the uh, Columbia system, a big portage, but there, paddle your canoe right to the Pacific Ocean. I mean, that was a huge competitive advantage to that company on, you know, bulk transport of, of, of transport of goods directly into the heart of the continent. So a lot of these other companies could not compete after a certain amount of time, particularly when the local beaver supply in their region was beavered out. And it, now, when there was the Northwest Company, which was, you know, I'd mentioned there was, you know, the French and Iroquois voyageurs and Scottish management tapping into London capital being run out of Montreal. That's an interesting combination of things there for the 18th century. They had huge supply lines paddling, you know, multiple different canoes, gigantic canoes that could have tons, tons of equipment at them paddling throughout the, all across the Great Lakes to the western end of Lake Superior, where they had a giant massive fort built. Um, the, people from Montreal would paddle all these huge quantities of goods all the way west, dump it down to this fort, turn around and, and transport themselves back to Montreal with reloaded up with all the furs that were brought in and the western trading partners would have brought it, all their furs east to this fort along the different river systems and, and do the swap over there in the midsummer when there was a huge party that went on for you know, a drunken debauchery kind of a uh, crazy thing that went on for quite a while. And then they, they each went their separate ways, east, east to west. Their logistics became so complicated that they were always trying to, you know, with the, the American fur company and John Jacob Astor had this idea that these these supply lines are becoming logistical nightmares for us. If we could only find some way of establishing a depot on the Pacific Ocean, and that was the, you know, the Columbia River, which was famously discovered by, you know, the Boston Sea Captain Robert Gray around 1790. Um, if they, they wanted to get over there and build a depot, and so they had tried to send and establish a settlement in a 
you know, a, an outpost there so that they could manage the sea otter trade and, and the fur trade from the Pacific Ocean. And of course, there was mixed results. And that's a very interesting, interesting story. But the logistical complications that developed over time and the competition between these these companies within their different regions is, you know, a significant part of what I write about in my book and a fascinating, fascinating stories. It's hard to summarize it all up because so much of it is detail oriented to. Yeah, it's a big question. And it even goes, it goes back to the origins of the company and trying to maintain a monopoly uh, in a part of the world that was, you know, just opening up to European um, uh, settlers and, and, um, uh, discovery. They were still trying to find the passage to the, you know, the Spice Islands. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was it was a young land to Europeans, um, and uh, they, you know, the English and the company were trying to keep the French out of their territory, and it, it just sort of all all goes from there. And it, it the idea of trying to keep a hold of this strange, huge land under mm -hmm. one company seems, you know, it boggles the mind. Yeah, and there, one, one cr uh, crazy incident that happened was a, a fellow named Peter Skeen Ogden, who was from the, he was a loyalist who fled up and ended up living in the south shore of the St. Lawrence River in what today is, is Quebec. And he ended up uh, being sent out west. He was a bit of a, a rabble rouser in his youth, accused of murder and, and some other um, sort of bullying type crimes. Anyway, he was sent further west to get him he was either going to be sent back and put on trial for murder or they, they got rid of him by sending him out to Oregon. And he ended up going to Oregon. And then George Simpson was there and in the 1830s. His uh, job was to collect together a bunch of other ruffians and go further west into like Idaho and maybe parts of Montana and go and hunt and exterminate all the beavers that they could. And the purpose of doing this was George Simpson noticed there's a whole bunch of Americans. Those evil Americans are coming out. We've got to go and kill all the beavers. So as they progress west, they will come to an area that's no longer profitable for them to pursue this trade. And then we'll preserve our Western beaver without any competition. And so you can see the type of tactics these people were was that to. Was that an actual mandate to go out and kill the competition's beaver? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they wanted to create a beaver free zone. And it was, it was definitely in with politics. And George Simpson was there, writing to the colonial representative of Britain, telling them this is what we have to do. Otherwise, you know, he was thinking, otherwise, the company, he was saying it's a political thing. And we don't want Great Britain to lose its claim over this land, because of course, no one had any, you know, the empires were battling back and forth over who was going to claim it. But really, in the back of his mind, his personal interest and the company's interest was, wow, we can't allow all these competitors into our land. We're enjoying a really nice monopoly right now where we can, you know, more or less uh, get very high prices for the highest quality furs and bring in some, you know, goods and have a very stable, profitable trade for ourselves. If all of a sudden there's thousands of competitors undercutting us, that's no good. So, yeah. They wow. deliberately went and killed 100,000 beavers to prevent anyone from being able to pass through that dead zone into the further beavers that were west. Well, one of the questions had to do with why why is George Simpson being cast as a villain? Certainly that's part of it. Yeah, I mean, he was a nasty person on so many levels. I think, I think that in many places I've read the word psychopath or sociopath would be associated with his personality now and he of course managed an information empire where by being a bit of a dictator and technology being what it was he controlled everything that came into and out of the fur trade region that was under his management mm -hmm. um so he created i i called it an information empire he he controlled what the directors in london knew about what was going on and he manipulated data and information and he knew that if he kept the profits very high the, he would be left alone. And the more that he was left alone, the greater was his power. And he was a very power hungry individual, like to micromanage people's lives. And um, he was a nasty character in so many ways. I mean, he would just abuse uh, women, indigenous women, of course, he would just claim them and have them as their as his mistress for a while and then cast them off. He had at least 20 some children that people know about that he never took any responsibility for. He would command the the daughters of some of his senior management. He would demand, that, did he have access to their daughters? I mean, he was a nasty, nasty fellow in a lot of different ways, like, and caused a lot of problem and a lot of damage to people in societies during the time that he was there. So that's, that's 
more or less why he comes across as a villain. He kept core profits really high. So if you're only looking at a balance sheet, you'd say, wow, George Simpson, he's great. But if you attach any kind of morality to it at all, you say, yes, he could have had good profits, a little bit less than what they did if he hadn't have been if he hadn't been who he was. But yeah. Stephen, I, I just um before we, we run out of time on some of these these terrific questions that are coming in. Um, I have two, which I'll lay out for you. And then I think um, Margaret's going to join us again. Um, the, the first one is, why do you think of this? And perhaps you don't, but why do you think of this as a Canadian story? And then the second one, which maybe you can touch on just briefly, is what do you see as the future of the company as it exists now? Oh, okay. I mean, it's true. I, I actually don't think of this as a Canadian Canadian story at all. Of course, the company pre-exists the existence of the U.S. or Canada by a hundred years, and but it was it was very important for shaping the politics of our two countries because it controlled the whole trade, especially in those northern border areas and all of the western thing. I mean, the border was a result of the company's actions and interactions throughout that time. It was the publishers who thought it was a. Uh, they defined it as a Canadian story versus an American story. And, you know, of course, my publisher for it is called Double Day Canada, which is just a br branch of the giant, massive, multinational New York based, uh, you know, Penguin Random House. Mm -hmm. um, oddly enough, the book is printed in the US and then shipped to Canada. I guess that's a, somewhat of an academic distinction for most people. But I guess what it comes down to is that, that then the marketing on it ended up having a Canadian angle instead of an American angle. And they defined it that way. I wish they hadn't have because it's not. A, I see. At all. But yeah. and as to the company's existence for the future, I mean, uh, I don't know. It's a retail store now. I mean, it sells perfume and clothing and it has a different management structure and it's not the same thing. So I. You know, I don't know. Everyone's shopping online. I mean, it was kind of shut down during the pandemic. I mm -hmm. thought it was going to go bankrupt. I was interviewed about whether I thought it was going to go bankrupt as if I had some kind of knowledge. You're the expert now. You're going <laughs> to yeah. have to join the board. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's, you know, it's funny because we grew up with the beaver on the back of the nickel, um, you know, a source of a monetary unit. And having read this fantastic adventure story, um, which is also a book about history and also a book about business. Um, I have an increased understanding of why that beaver's on the nickel. Um, it's, it's truly a fantastic read. I, you know, I, I don't usually read popular history on the beach, but it really is a beach read as well as being uh, incredibly informative. It reads beautifully. Congratulations on the release. And, and I, I really recommend it to our audience heartily thank you jeff that's right. uh, jeff do you also know that the beaver is on the medallions in the subway in astor place on the four five on the the number six train in i sure York, do green dot oh. uh so that the beaver has really also been you know we, primary in the founding of new york and its housing and oh, you know that the beaver yeah. reigns also in new york city as you jeff um, a New Yorker, I'm sure I've seen. Yes. Yeah. So it's uh, it's amazing yeah. how this story, just as Stephen says, is so appropriate both to the United States and to Canada. Yeah. And um, I really thank you both for this remarkable history of both Canada and the US. Uh, and heading toward the end of our time together, I'd like to shift now to our closing reading from the book, which we asked you to do. Stephen, will you share some last words before we wrap up, please? Over to you. Sure. I'd almost forgotten about that. It's a good, it's a good thing I put a bookmark in earlier. <laughs> George Simpson was the greatest tragedy to befall the company and Northern North America since its founding in 1670. Although he may have made a select group of people a lot of money in the end, he cost them their honor. Rather than helping to prepare its employees, contractors and customers for the tectonic changes that were shaking the land in the later 19th century, Simpson, not surprisingly, considering his past, turned on them hastening and exacerbating the damage. The period of the company's greatest unchallenged commercial success correlated to its, period, its period of greatest moral turpitude. It didn't have to end that way. The reputation of such a venerable institution should have counted for more. Simpson was merely the first wave of betrayal, but he set a powerful precedent for the settlers who came during and after his tenure, brushing away a more open corporate culture and customs that had evolved over, cent uh, over countless generations. <laughs> 
Simpson consumed the company's goodwill for his own advancement and the material gain of a select handful of willfully blind absentee investors, like a rabid dog gnawing on its own leg, all the while thinking it was a great triumph. But the final years of the company's monopoly shouldn't taint its first 100 and 170, which were more dynamic and surprising. During that time, the company evolved from a band of bewildered foreigners eking out their lives in trading posts along the sparsely inhabited, rugged rim of a vast unknown continent to a mostly domestic entity of blended cultures and customs dealing amongst themselves. Although most of the profits ended up in, love, in London, most of the drama occurred in Western and Northern North America. The land was changed and people's lives were altered in pursuit of the fur, the beaver and other animals. Apart from the technical minutiae, the company's business, like all business, was fundamentally about managing people in relationships. It was these relationships over the generations that had such a profound influence on the course of history. Thousands of people ghosted through the annals of the company's history, some taking their memories with them when they died, others leaving behind families or just their stories. They had their time, made their choices, saw something of the world and left their disappearing footprints across the land. A company is nothing other than a legal entity for tax and accounting purposes. It has no life of its own. It's a bloodless thing, an imaginary construct that can unify and motivate people to a common endeavor. The company was merely a vessel for the, char the dreams, aspirations, hopes, and ambitions of the thousands of men and women whose contributions animated it for two centuries, in the process transforming a continent. The company was nothing other than its people and their stories. Everything else is now dust, and we live in their world just as they live in ours. Stephen, that's, that's really lovely. Uh, you've indeed written a really riveting story. And, um, and indeed our ancestors are living in us and we're living in them. And, and, and someday we'll all be able to cross the Canadian border with, with <laughs> Egypt again. Um, and meanwhile, a, a very good candidate day to you. You did just a perfect presentation for us. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Jeff, for bringing the company and all of Canada uh, to life for us. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much, Jeff, for this discussion of history. Jeff, I can't wait for your cansplaining uh, podcast. So get to work on that for all of us, please. Uh, I will keep you posted. <laughs> please. That sounds and interesting. Yeah. We want to hear the music of the uh, Breithaupt brothers as well, please, and your yes. lyrical work. So thank you for joining us. Um, and to the audience out there, thank you so much for your interest. Um, happy Canada to all, Canada Day to all, and sunny days ahead from those of us in Boston, from Stephen's publisher in Toronto, from Jeff at Mystic Seaport. Thank you, Mystic Seaport. We are so grateful. And to Stephen in Alberta, we are so jealous. Your day continues. Enjoy the sunshine. Enjoy the Rocky Mountains. Happy Canada Day to all, and thank you. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>